Good morning, friends. This is Pastor Bill Howden. We are indeed having technical difficulties, and I hope that you will bear with us. Um, the problem of Karen and Lance being sideways was they were trying to do something that I had suggested yesterday. A few people are just beginning to come on, so I'm going to keep saying a few words until more join us. Uh, thank you all for your patience. It has been a week in which we needed a good deal of patience. And as Karen and I have just demonstrated, we are not technical experts. So we ask for your patience and your care. I am go Before we go to the pastoral prayer, I am going to wait a few more minutes for people to join us. And then we will see how we can proceed here. I hope that all of you this morning are warm and that you are uh, safe. It has been a very rough week. And I want you to know that I am praying for all of you and ask your prayers for one another in these difficult times. I'm also going to take just a moment here to try and adjust the mount for my phone so you don't see quite so much of the roof and see more of me. There, that looks a little bit better. Now, we will try, uh, after I finish the pastoral prayer and sermon, to throw this back to uh, bring Lance and Karen um, back on. Uh, thank you again for your patience. I see that most people have rejoined us now. So I am going to ask that we go to God in prayer. Oh God, this has been a tough, tough week. We have been cold and we have been anxious our church building has suffered damage and several of us have suffered damage to our homes. O loving creator who shaped the universe from a formless void, bring order out of all our chaos. O gracious Christ, who calm the stormy sea, calm all of our storms, the storms of cold and snow, the storms of anger and fear, the storms without and the storms within. O oh, generous spirit, the comforter, walk with us, guide us, encourage us, and challenge us to be the people Christ calls us to be. O oh Lord our God, we pray for all who have been impacted by this storm. We pray for everyone whose names are on our prayer list. So many needs that are known better by you than by us. We bring before you our own secret needs that we 
hesitate to share with others. Hold them all, O God, in your loving arms, and embrace us all by your grace. We pray for all who have suffered damage in this storm. We ask for healing for all who are ill. We ask your comfort for all who mourn. We ask for guidance for this congregation as together we seek to discern our way forward into your future. Guide us in your truth and teach us your ways. In accord with your great love, O God, remember us. According to your great love, remember us. Amen. Thank you again for your patience. Thank you again for Karen and Lance and Esther to be there in the church and lead our worship. Um, after the sermon, I will try to bring Karen back on and let me go over a little bit of the technical things there. Part of the problem um, that we had earlier was Karen trying to do something that I asked her to do. And that's why they ended up standing on their sides. So I don't know what went wrong, but it didn't go right. So uh, we'll try this again afterward. Karen, a word for you. Part of my problem coming on is I had logged in as the church and then couldn't come in as myself. So when I throw it back to you later on, make sure you are looking in your personal account, not the church account, because I think that's what you will have to do since I'm on the church account now. Okay, technology, ain't it wonderful? Sometime I'm going to have to find a teenager who can explain it all to me. But for right now, let us go back to consider God's word. Remember, remember, remember. Three times in verses 6 and 7 of the psalm that Lance read for us, the psalmist calls on God to remember. What would you like God to remember? And what would you like God to not remember? For that is the psalmist's second request, actually. The psalm asks, psalm asks, Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. What would you like God to remember? While you're thinking about that, let me mention one more technical thing. I'm sitting, looking out a window right past my cell phone, and outside of that window are wind chimes that are chiming right now. I'm not sure if that's picking up on my microphone or not, but if it is, just consider it God's musical accompaniment to our worship. What would you like God to remember? Now, I might be inclined to draw up a list of all of my accomplishments and good deeds. Let's see, there, there was the time I helped out my neighbor when they really, really needed some help. And I've given quite a lot of money to the food bank over the years. I'd like God to remember that. And then, this is the big one. I've served on a lot of church committees and I would certainly like God to remember that and be grateful for that. 
But that's not what the psalm asks. That's not what the psalmist asks God to remember at all. What the psalm begins with is, Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love. Remember, O God, your compassion and steadfast love. I have no claim on you, God, because of who I am, but because of who you are, O God. I dare to come before you. I dare to lift up my soul to you, as the psalm says. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love. The word for mercy is sometimes translated compassion. The Hebrew word actually comes from the same root as the word for a mother's womb. To say that God is merciful, God is compassionate, is to say that God loves us like a mother loves her children. Remember your great mercy and love. Many translations say steadfast love. The Hebrew word is chesed, which is notoriously difficult to translate into English. Kathy Sackenfeld, who was one of my seminary professors, wrote a whole book about this word because it's so important, so prominent in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, the title of her book is Faithfulness in Action, with a subtitle of Loyalty in Biblical Perspective. Even in the title and subtitle, she had to use two different words, faithfulness and loyalty, to try to wrap together all of the meaning of this one Hebrew word. Another Old Testament scholar puts it this way. He describes this as tenacious fidelity. Tenacious fidelity in a relationship. Readiness and resolve to continue to be loyal to those to whom one is bound. Now that's a rather academic way to put it. I might put it this way. Even if you are ready to give up on God, God will never give up on you. That's what this means. God's steadfast love. Remember, O oh God, your compassion and your tenacious love. Remember your love that never gives up. That is what the psalmist would like God to remember. And then the psalmist says, Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. Well, friends, what would you like God to remember not? What would you like God to remember not? Well, there is quite a bit on my list, but I'm not going to share that with you in great detail this morning. Now, there are no major big crimes that I have to confess, but there's still a lot that nags at my conscience. There are angry words that I can never take back. There are selfish acts that I regret very much. An ancient prayer of confession says, O oh God, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Let me see. Thought word, 
and deed. I can check all of those boxes. And then that prayer continues. We have sinned against you in thought, in word, in deed, in what we have done, and in what we have failed to do. Yeah, that hits home too. That's another long list. The kind word that was never spoken. The helping hand that was never offered. The stand against injustice that I never took. What would you like God to remember not? Whatever it is, it is not too big for God to forget. Whatever is on your list, it is no match for God's mercy and God's great love. Way back in the 6th century, one of the leaders of the ancient church was a man called Isaac of Nineveh. And Isaac put it this way. He said, imagine you are standing beside a running stream, not a big, wide river, just a small little mountain stream, one you could almost step across if you would like. And then he says, imagine that you stoop down and you pick up a big handful of dirt. It's kind of muddy and yucky stuff. And you take that handful of dirt and you throw that into the stream. Now, Isaac says, do you think that handful of dirt is going to stop that stream from flowing? He says it's kind of like that with our sins and the abundant stream of God's love. In his own words, just as the strength of a flowing stream is not hindered by a handful of earth, so the compassion of the Creator is not daunted by the wickedness of his creatures. That handful of dirt is not going to do a thing to stop the flow of that stream. Remember, remember, remember. At the end, the psalmist comes back to this. According to your love, remember me, for you are God, you are good, O Lord. Don't remember according to what I have done according to what I have failed to do. According to your love, remember me, O God, for you are good. You see, it's not about us, not about our strengths or our weaknesses. It is about the greatness of our God. Dr. Ron Rollheiser is a Catholic priest who recently retired from his position as president of Oblate School of Theology here in San Antonio, where I live. In one of his books, Dr. Rollheiser writes, We teach that God is unconditional love, but seldom take that seriously enough. We still don't seem to have grasped, he continues, the compassion and the love of God that was revealed to us in Jesus Christ. We really don't take seriously enough how much Christ loved us. And then he goes on to write, Do we ever really believe that God loves us long before any sin we commit and long after any sin we could ever commit. 
do we? Do we really believe that God loves us long before any sin we commit and long after every sin we will ever commit? According to your love, O God, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. And that's why we can join with the psalmist in saying, as the first verse of this psalm says, To you, O God, I lift up my soul. I offer it to you. The word used for soul here really means one's entire being one's entire being. And as we journey through this season of Lent that we are entering, this Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent. It's a time for self-examination, a time, a time to consider how closely we follow our God. But it's a time for us to remember we can lift up our entire being to God, warts and all, all of our failures and our accomplishments, our fears and our dreams, our hopes and our joys, we can bring it all before our God. Before, because the greater you know, more you know about God, as someone has put it, you will discover that the heart of God is mercy within mercy within mercy. That, my friends, is what we should remember. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for your love. We ask that you be with us as we journey through Lent, as we journey through our lives together. In Christ's name, amen. Now, we get me to try the technology here to bring Karen and the group at the church back on with us. So let us see if I am successful in that. Okay, uh, we're going to Lance's video now. And we should be coming on. And there is Karen with us again. We have succeeded. And thank you for turning your phone right side up. I'm sorry I messed that up when I told you yesterday to do it the other way. That's okay. Okay. Can you hear me, Bill? Yes. Okay, I could not get it to work on my phone or Kim's phone because it kept logging in as First Christian Church every time mm -hmm. we tried to join you. So we're on Lance's phone, but we're wonderfully yeah. ready to sing. Okay, before we sing, I want to say just a word as we prepare for communion. Um, first, we will be sharing communion and I invite you, if you've not already done so, during the communion hymn, to get some bread and a cup and to um, juice or whatever you have to share in communion with us. And then I um, will, um, we will share communion. Before we sing the hymn, I do want to... Um, just remind you that this communion above all else is a place to remember how much God loves us. It is the memory of Christ's broken body, dead blood. And it's a remembrance of the uh, resurrection of Christ to new life. As someone has said, how much did Christ loved us, love us? All the way up to the head of the nails. Let us remember as we sing. Amen. 
remembrance of thee eat this bread in remembrance of me drink this wine in remembrance of me pray for the time when god's own will is done in remembrance of me heal the sick in remembrance of me be the poor in remembrance of me open the door and let your neighbor in let them Let us pray. As the Holy Spirit strengthens your church, O God, may this your blessed bread, which is now broken, bring life to us. May we be living signs of the charity we share with one another. May this your holy cup, poured out for all, be our salvation. We pray that we who drink from the one cup may be faithful signs of your love. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink you all from this, for this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us partake and remember. Before we conclude our service, I want to say a few words about 
the part of our service that is missing. Of course, one part that is missing is being together. And we all miss that terribly. And with the damage to the church and the pandemic, we still don't know when we're going to be able to be together. We hope it will be soon. Just stay tuned and we'll figure this out. But the other part of the service that we're missing is our offering, our giving to the God. I want to say several things about that. I want to remind you, first of all, that our offering is truly a part of our worship. It's a way of praising God and giving God thanks for all of God's gifts to us. Our offering is also a way that we obey Christ's commandment to love one another. So I want to encourage you, even though we're not together, to continue your offerings to the church. You can mail your check to the church office. You can um, go online to the church website and contribute through the website. Today, I have a special appeal about an offering because this Sunday and next Sunday are the two Sundays when our denomination, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, when our sister congregations throughout the United States and Canada will be taking up our Week of Compassion offering, one of the special offerings of our denomination. Week of Compassion is our ministry arm that funds economic development programs in poor communities throughout the United States and around the world. It funds refugee assistance programs. And most important at this time, it funds disaster relief programs. In case you haven't noticed it, folks, we've been in a disaster this last week. And the larger church is aware of that and they want to help us. Friday afternoon, I was on a Zoom call with, organized by Reverend Andy Mangum, our regional minister for the Christian Church in the Southwest, about what the larger church can do to help us. I know that Kim Lee was on the phone call as well, and someone else was in the office with her, but I couldn't see who it was on the Zoom call. And we heard about what the larger church can do for us, First of all, our general minister and president of our denomination, Teresa Hurd Owens, was on the phone with us and prayed for us and brought us the concerns of the larger church. We also heard from Disciples Church Extension, and one of their representatives talked about the emergency loans that they can offer to churches for building repairs after disaster. Most important, one of the vice presidents for Week of Compassion was with us. And she talked about the grants that Week of Compassion can offer for assistance. They can offer grants directly to congregations for repairs to damage to their buildings. They can offer grants through congregations to church members who have suffered damage or other economic loss because of the storm. They also offer grants to churches to help in programming that reaches out to the community at large through food pantries or using the church for emergency shelter or anything that has caused unusual expenses for the church in its programming to the community. So there are two important messages from this that I want you to hear about Week of Compassion. One, if you have suffered damage in your home or other economic loss because of this disaster, contact us at the church office. Through Week of Compassion, we may be able to get you some help. The second thing I want to say is for those of us like myself who were badly inconvenienced by the storm this week but suffered no financial loss. Consider giving generously to the week of compassion. 
That money doesn't come from thin air. It comes from the contributions of people like you and like me. It is a way that we can reach out to help our neighbors in need in our own congregation, but also in churches around Texas and in other places around the country. Again, you can give to Week of Compassion by simply writing a check, putting it in the mail, sending it to First Christian Church in Kerrville. Make the check out to the church, but on the memo line, note that it is for Week of Compassion. Also, you can go online directly to the Week of Compassion website, weekofcompassion.org. Again, weekofcompassion.org. If you give through the website, you will have the opportunity to designate your gift for storm relief. I think it's fire and storm relief is the category that will help directly for the disaster relief that is being undertaken in Texas at this time. It's very simple. I made a gift yesterday through that website. I encourage you to give generously as well. So I thank you for your patience for this rather extended public service announcement, infomercial as it will. But this is important stuff. It's important that we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And Week of Compassion is one of the ways we can do that. Let us pray. Most giving and forgiving God, you provide for our every need. You open our lips to offer you praise. You strengthen our hands to respond to Christ's call. With heart, hands, and voices renewed by your spirit, we place now before you our commitment to serve. Use us in ways that will benefit others and accept what we offer as a sign of our faith. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, friends, may Christ's spirit dwell within you. May his word abide in you. His will guide you. His joy strengthen you. As you give him your lives in loving service. And may God bless you and go with you to comfort and to encourage you this week and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, my friends, to love and serve our God.